Right. So this one is about the, let me see. All right, this one is about the muscle. So this is an extension. Not sure how these things work, but anyway, I hope it works. <laughs> All right, guys, so this one is about the muscle. So this is an extension from our um, cell. So in the cell, we talk about the regular, like a typical uh, cell physiology. And then let me get started, sorry. <clears throat> All right, guys, so this one is about muscle cells, muscle. So in this, in this portion, we will talk about muscle. We will only talk about muscle. <laughs> um, we will not talk about the, uh, the neuromuscular junction. We will talk about the neuromuscular junction later. And uh, this one, we will just talk about the muscle. And, uh, and uh, the material coming from the textbook, Guide and the Hall, chapter six and seven. So if you are interested, you can, you can take a look. So the objectives are that um, we will kind of compare three muscle. I bet that you probably learned this already. So this is a very quick overview. Um, three type of muscle. And uh, um, and then we will talk about the muscle uh, memory potential and the action potential. Um, and then we will talk about the uh, contraction process of the muscle and uh, talk about that contraction will cause the, uh, will induce the twitch and the tension of the muscle. So, Three type of muscle in our body are skeletal muscles. That's the one we are fo we will focus today. And uh, cardiac muscle is in the heart. That's gonna be our next topic. And a smooth muscle. So all these voluntary movements are conducted by the skeletal muscle. Um, skeletal muscle and the cardiac muscle are common in a way that they all appear with striated appearance. So you can see that um, they have this striated appearance. So these two are called striated muscle. Smooth muscle are the muscle in the GI system, gastrointestinal system, and, uh, and in the vessels. So this one is very important to control our vessel diameter. And this one, smooth muscle and the cardiac muscle are working together to conduct our cardiovascular system. Uh, even though they, have, they may have some diversity in these muscles, but the 
their function is very similar. Basically, that they have uh, the muscle. The major function of the muscle is to conduct the contraction, and uh, this contraction is conducted by the proteins in the cells. So that's the protein we mentioned earlier. That's why we need to talk about the cells before. So these proteins uh, synthesize, uh, 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 construct these um, contractiles in the cells and that contractile, including the actin and the myosin, the thin filaments and the thick filaments are the major the components to conduct this muscle contraction. Another thing you can also notice is that uh, skeletal muscle has multiple nucleus in each muscle cells. So each of these muscle fibers is a uh, is each of these muscle fiber is a cell. So here is one cell, and you can see that there are multiple nuclei. Uh, their location usually is is located underneath the cell membrane. Uh, so it's not like in the center of the cell. So that's the unique part because the other muscle cells, cardiac muscle and the smooth muscle, there they are only they have only one each cell has only one nucleus. So the point was that um, the, the thing you need to memorize is that um, three type muscle, striated muscle are skeletal muscle and, and uh, cardiac muscle. And uh, um, skeletal muscle has multiple nucleus. The other two only has single nucle nucleus. Now cell, these cells construct our muscle organ. So in your anatomy, you should already learn that we have a uh, different we have like 30, 360 around that uh, uh, number of the muscle in our body. And uh, you probably spent a lot of time trying to uh, memorize all this. And you are, I assume you, since you take this class, I assume that your anatomy is, you, you pass your anatomy. So each of this muscle organ, the, the, the muscle you see in the anatomy, anatomy lab, whether that's virtual lab or is a real lab, you see that each of this muscle, right? And each muscle organ basically is composed by, each organ has different cells. Uh, and, and here is that uh, the major portion is muscle cells. So here, each muscle organ, the outer is, has a package in a way that the outer membrane is the uh, uh, epimyosin. Epimyosin protect the muscle, put everything together. Inside of this uh, epimyosin, we have these uh, perimyosin. Perimyosin basically is a compartment to pack this group of muscle cells. Uh, this group muscle cell is called a uh, fascicle. So this is the fascicle and they're packed by the perimyosin. Now in the in this in each of these fascicles we have the muscle cells. Each muscle fiber is a muscle cell. And uh, that's also packed by the uh, uh endosim endomyosin to pack these um, muscle cells. And of course, uh, in, a, in this organ, we not just have the muscle cells, we also have nerve, we also have blood vessel to provide the control and uh, uh, fluid uh, oxygen supplies into the muscle cells. So each cell, this is one single muscle cell. Each cell has a cell membrane. The cell membrane in the muscle is called sarcolima. And uh, you can see that it has multiple nuclei. Uh, sarcolima is a cell membrane. And inside of the cell, um, so we have the nucleus, which is not in the center, but in the, 
in the like peripheral, like just underneath the uh, cell membrane. And then we have different organelles. If you may recall that we mentioned about several organelles, uh, such as the nucleus, that's right here, and uh, mito mitochondria. Mitochondria is right here. We have a lot of mitochondria to generate ATP. We also have a membrane bond or membranous organelle and a non-membranous organelle. So here we have the uh, here we have the uh, cytoskeleton to form a thin filament. We also have a protein mousein to form the thick filament. All these are are uh, packed in this uh, myofibril. So here you can see that this is one myofibril. So this basically is the smallest like units of the um, of the muscle cells, and this is the place that we conduct the muscle contraction. Uh, we also have an endoplasmic reticulum in the cell, but in the muscle is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's right here. So in that mile fibrio, uh, we have this structure uh, is composed of the thin filaments and the thick filaments. And uh, uh, if we just showing it here uh, in the picture, you can see that's how the thin filaments and the thick filaments are composed. You can see that they are all aligned very well. And that's why we see we have this striated appearance of the of the cell. Uh, here is the uh, Z line. Z line connect with the thin filament. Here is the M line. The M is like middle line. M line here. M line con connect with the thick filament. So these blue lines are the thick filament. Uh, here is the Z line connect with the thin filament. So when muscle contract this uh, cross bridge will contact with the thin filament and the to conduct a pooling so these two z line will come together and to make the muscle contraction to make this the the, the range of from z line to z line is called a sarcomere so that sarcomere will become shorter and shorter. So that will be, that will be the mechanism how muscle conduct this contraction. Uh, this striated appearance uh, coming from the zone that we have the I band. I band is a region that we only have the thin filament. A band, A band is the is the overlap of thin and the thick filament. Um, uh, major basically it's a it's a component of the thick filament. This uh, um, in the middle of that we have the edge band, edge band the region where we only have the thick filament but no thin filament. When we see the muscle, we basically only see uh, if we look at like a um, um, uh, to see this right the appearance, we see the dark region and the light region. This light region are coming from this eye band. Here the re reason is also called the reason it's called eye band is that it's isotropic. It means that this region when light penetrate through it, the color is the same. It's all penetrate through it. Through it. So you see it's very much like light. Uh, light can penetrate through it. So it's a light band or I band. Here we have the A band. A band is an overlap of thin filament and the thick filament. So because it's overlapped, and uh, when you see it from different angle, you might see light go through it. You might not see light go through it. So it's an isotropic and it's also the place to provide you the dark band. So that's the major structure of the 
myofibril and uh, the unit of the, uh, the the major components in this unit uh, in this uh, sarcomere. All right, so the major player here is the thin filament and the thick filament. Now, the next step is that we will need to learn how these two filaments conduct the contraction. The very simple idea is that this thick filament has this mouth in head, this cross bridge. This cross bridge will anchor on the thin filament and uh, pull it. So eventually we will have two Z line come together. When muscle contract, muscle becomes shorter, the sarcomere becomes shorter. And that basically is conducted by the, this uh, cross bridge to cool the thin filament. Now the question is that how does it work? And uh, what's the pathway to it? So here is the, the uh, more detail about this sarcomere, uh, this, the, the uh, Z line and the Z line between these two Z line is the uh, sarcomere. And here is a Z line, Z line, thin filament, thick filament. Uh, and they, here you see this uh, cross bridge to cause muscle contraction. So we will learn, what we are going to learn is the components of this thick filament and the thin filament. First, you need to know that. The second is that we will learn how they interact with each other. Now, the thick filament is right here, this uh, purple blue structure. Uh, it's composed of one major thing that is called myosin. So here is the myosin. Myosin uh, is, uh, has uh, four units. Uh, it has uh, two long chain. So here is a myosin head. So you can, you, can, you can imagine that this is coming from the protein. So this is a protein. And this protein originally is a linear structure and, uh, and uh, is folded form this alpha helix and alpha helix packaged all together. We have uh, two alpha helix, two two peptide bind together uh, to twist it together to form this myosin, myosin tail. And in the end, we have the myosin head. Uh, we also, on the myosin head, we have another uh, uh, portion to, to, uh, to, to, to bind with the actin as well as to conduct the uh, ATP, ATPS. So to use ATP to generate the energy. And when myosin have the ATP as the energy, then it can tilt. When it bind with actin, tilt, then it can pull the myosin to, toward the thin filaments toward the M line and to make the contraction. So that's the myosin. Now the thin filaments, the thin filaments have three major components. Uh, one is the actin. Here is actin. Remember that was the uh, cytoskeleton to compose by the actin. In general, that cell has actin too. Uh, cell use actin to compose uh, microfilament. So that's the major like, cytoskeleton in all cells. So you see actin basically everywhere in all cells. It's very is probably the one of the most abundant protein in our cells. That all cells has the actin. And they use this actin, like these little bits, combined together to form the cytoskeleton. In muscle, we also have this actin. This actin connect together to form the major structure of the thin filament. So that's one. And the other two are the troponin. Troponin is a three components complex. And the tropomyosin, tropomyosin is right here. So we have three components in the thin filament, actin, 
miles, uh, trouble miles in and the trouble in. So we will learn all this. So this is the thick filament. Uh, come, uh, the major component of the thick filament is the myosin. And uh, myosin has uh, uh, coming from the it's, it's a protein protein product, and uh, uh, is a has a long chain, heavy, ch long 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 tail, and the two heads. These two heads. Uh, produced pro provide the uh, uh, the binding sites with the actin. So here is in you can see here you have um, we have the actin binding sites on the myosin head as well as the ATP binding site to bind the ATP. So you need to keep in mind that actin binding site is on myosin. And in the actin, you will see the myosin binding site. So the actin binding site is on myosin. And the myosin binding site is on actin. Maybe you, you will see that. So this is the myosin, the thin, thick filament of myosin. Uh, and the, it forms, we have a lot of this myosin protein to form this thick filament. As for the thin filaments, we the major components, three three components, actin. This one called G actin molecule. G means global, globular. That means that it's a, like a round little bit structure. And uh, here is the tropomyosin and the troponin. Actin is one of the major cytoskeleton uh, is the components of microfilaments in all other cells. This is one of the major cytoskeleton in all cells. Just quick review that microtubule, intermediate filament, and the microfilament. Microtubule is composed of what? Tubulin. So this one is this little dots is is tubulin. Uh, microfilament is composed of actin, and so these two microtubule and the microfilament are dynamically assembled and disassembled. Uh, uh, so allow cells to change its um, morphology very rapid, very rapidly uh, when the condition. Uh, when, when it's needed. Uh, in contrast, the intermediate filaments is, is more durable, it's more stable, so they do not dis disassemble and assemble that rapidly. So this is a thin filament. We have three components. Um, I want to show you here is that this black spot is called myosin binding site. We probably will see it later. All right, three components. Now, these three components, actin, is like what we have learned in the microfilament. Uh, trouble myosin cover this myosin binding site. So move, basically this is a structure to prevent myosin and actin bind together. Now let's look at this troponin. Troponin has three components, troponin I, troponin T, troponin C. So this is a complex of three components to, com to, conduct, to, to, to work together to form this troponin. Each component have, dif have high affinity to different molecules. So troponin I has high affinity to actin. So this troponin I will anchor on the actin. Troponin T has high affinity to T tropomyosin. So it can, it has one hand to hold this tropomyosin. Troponin C has high affinity to calcium ions. 
So here, the top one you see basically is hanging there. It doesn't hang on to uh, anything. I holds on to the acting. T holds on to the trouble mouse. And uh, as I mentioned before, that this trouble mousing, uh, the function of this trouble mousing is to block the mousing binding side. So here you see that this little black thing is the mousing binding side. So this is the size that mousing binds to it. <clears throat> and so mousing has the acting binding side. Acting has this mousing binding side. So they they like to bind to each other, and uh, um, but uh, in the resting state, the trouble mouse block it, so they cannot bind to each other, and that prevent the muscle contraction. In order to active this muscle or to allow mouse in head to bind with acting, you need to remove the trouble mousing. And the way to do it is that we need to have calcium. So when the muscle is activated, calcium will go in. Calcium go in, we'll see the troponin C binds on troponin C, then troponin C will be activated, everything will be, uh, this, com this complex will conduct the conformational change. And uh, that will remove this trouble mouse away from the mouse binding site. And then the mouse binding site is are exposed to the actin. And then actin, the mouse can bind on it. So we need to have the calcium. So during the resting state, that mouse in binding sites are blocked by the trouble mouse in. When calcium go in it, so, so typically cell has very low concentration of the calcium. In the cell, the only thing high ions, the only thing high is potassium. Calcium, sodium, uh, everything else are low in the cell. So calcium going in binds on the troponin C, it will cause the conformational change. And that will remove the trouble mouse to allow the mouse in binding sites to be exposed. And then mouse in binds on it to cause the contraction. So here you can see it again, that resting state, mouse in binding sites um, is, uh, is, is blocked by the trouble mouse in calcium coming here, the mouse inside, mouse in binding side uh, are exposed. So here is the, the three components of the troponin complex. Troponin I uh, has high affinity to actin, troponin T has high affinity to trouble mousing, troponin C has high affinity to, to calcium. So this is the region that you will see quiz question. Uh, troponin I, C, T, which one has high, high affinity to acting? Troponin I. Which one has high affinity to trouble mousing? Troponin T. Which one has high affinity to calcium? Troponin C. And uh, to allow these excitation to allow this calcium coming in, um, we need to excite the cell. So the way we excite the muscle is that we have, we need to have the nerve. So we will spend more time talking about the neuromuscular junction. So in this portion, we just briefly talk about how muscle cell is excited. So the, the muscle cell are excited by the nerve. When nerves send signal to the muscle, they release a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine then binds on the receptor. Here's the muscle side. This is the nerve side. Acetylcholine binds on receptor to cause the excitation of the muscle. 
So the receptor of this uh, neurotransmitter is called nicotinic acetylcholine receptor or NACHR. This nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is a ligand-gated ion channel. So we talk about the ion channel in our cells. That's why we need to review it. So you have the idea that in a cell membrane, we have the protein. Protein form the channel. This channel can be gated or non-gated. If it's gated, it can be ligand-gated or voltage-gated. Here, showing you that we have this ligand-gated ion channel. So when you have this ion-gated ligand -gated ion channel, what well, you need to ask first that, what's the ligand? What's the ion? So here, the ligand is acetylcholine. It's not just activated by acetylcholine, it can also be activi activated by nicotine. So we have the term called nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So that's the ligand. What's the ion? The ion is sodium. So when ligand binds on it, the channel will open. Channel will open to the size that's not too big, not too small. Very good for the sodium to go through it. Now, when the channel open, sodiums can freely diffuse across. Was sodium going in or going out? Which portion has higher concentration of sodium? Is that extracellular or intracellular? It's extracellular. So in the extracellular space, we have more sodium. And the sodium will, when they see this channel open, high concentration of the sodium will flow into the cell. And so that's how we, the first thing we do to the muscle, the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, you need to remember this term, acetylcholine. That is the one and the only neurotransmitter for the skeletal muscle. So in the quiz question, you will see that which neurotransmitter for the skeletal muscle, and I have a list of that, and you will need to choose the acetylcholine. What's the receptor for uh, the neurotransmitter in the skeletal muscle? We well, have a list of that. You need to choose the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And what's the ion to go through this channel is a sodium. Now, sodium will go in because high concentration of sodium in the extracellular, low concentration in the cell, so sodium will flow in. Sodiums are positive charged ion. So it will bring the membrane potential to be positive. Remember that all cells has a memory potential that's driven by two contributing factor. One is the sodium potassium ATPS. It pumps three sodium out, two potassium in. And that makes the cell become negative. The second is that we have a small, we have a potassium leakage. So even though we keep pumping the potassium in, it's not going to be overflow. And so that's how we maintain the cell membrane potential to be negative. When the sodium coming in, you will change it. You will alter that balance. It will make the membrane potential to be not too negative, to be a little bit positive because these are positive charged ion. And that will trigger an action potential. So this is uh, the extension from the membrane potential is a non-rest memory potential. It's a memory potential, but it's not a rest memory potential. Here we basically alter it. We open a channel to allow sodium going in, and that changes the memory potential. When it changes the memory potential, it will trigger a sequence of the process to trigger an action potential. So let's look at this one here. Uh, this is a typical action potential. We have a resting membrane potential to be about negative 
70 millivolts. Um, and then we have two phases, two major phases. One is called depolarization. So this one going up is the depolarization. And going down is the repolarization. Uh, so, um, and during the depolarization, sodium channels open to allow sodiums going in. During the repolarization, the potassium channel open and the potassium channel, the potassium ion going out. Potassium are positive charge ions, so it will make it more negative to bring it back to the rested memory potential. So that's the action potential. Uh, so let's go, let's go over this one here. So basically that first we need to stimulate it. The way we stimulate it is to have a ligand gated sodium channel, right? In this case, it's a ligand gated sodium channel, the NaCHR, ligand binds it, sodium going in, bring the memory potential up. This potential is called the end plate potential because that is the potential that's stimulated by the nerve end plate into the muscle. This one will, if that potential is above a threshold, then it will trigger an action potential. Depolarization. We have the another group of the channel open. This is voltage gated sodium channel. That's because that they don't open unless the memory potential is above the threshold. And that bring it above the threshold is by ligand gated sodium channel in this case. And cell can be excited by different way. Different cells can be excited by different way. Like our hearing, you can hear me because your uh, hearing nerve cell are excited by the sound wave to bend your hair cell in your ear. And that's a different way to stimulate a nerve. When you touch things, you feel things. That's because your nerve got excited and that's another way that mechanically you bend some receptor in your skin and that bring the memory potential to be above the threshold to trigger the action potential. Action potential has a, a feature or properties that is either excited or not. Uh, so your stimulus can be small, can be high, can be large, but as long as it's above the threshold, it will generate the same type, same size of the action potential all the time. All right, so then we have the uh, sodium channel open. So this sodium channel is different from the ligand gated sodium channel. This sodium channel is a voltage gated sodium channel. They are sensitive to the environment, to the voltage. So when the memory potential is above the threshold, it, that voltage difference, that voltage change will trigger this sodium channel. And then we have the uh, voltage gated potassium channel. This one won't open unless the memory potential is different. Uh, it's above, basically it's, it's is reached to the depolarization is not polarized. Here we have the polarized. During the rest memory potential, it's polarized. One side is negative, the other side is zero. But now it's almost like zero or even positive memory potential. And that caused the opening of the potassium channel. Potassium channel open. When potassium channel open, will potassium going in or going out? of the cell. Which part has more potassium, extracellularly or intracellularly? Intracellularly, right? Because in a cell, nothing but potassium is high in a cell. So we have a lot of potassium in the cell. When the channel open, potassium will flow out. 
and potassium are positive charged ions, so when they flow out, the membrane potential will become negative. All right, so that's the action potential. Action potential is a membrane potential. It's just, it's not a rest membrane potential, it's an active membrane potential. So this membrane potential, you can see it across the membrane. You don't see it. it's like a ocean wave. Ocean wave only on the surface of the wave, but not like deep ocean, right? And so this electron, this voltage only exists in the surface of the cell, on the cell membrane. So here showing you that this is nerve ending, nerve axon terminal. Axon is the, the extended from the cell body, that's nerve. We will talk about nerve later. So that nerve ending has this axon terminal. It, when we need to excite the muscle, we need to first excite the nerve. Nerve will release the acetylcholine to bind on what receptor? The NACHR. And what's the consequence? It will trigger an action potential. Now, action potential will travel, will propagate along the cell membrane. When it moves across the cell membrane, it will travel along the cell membrane. Here, there is a unique structure in the muscle. It's called T-tubule. T-tubule is the extension of the plasma membrane, the cell membrane. So it will bring the action potential down here to get very close to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the action potential down here, it will trigger a channel called DHP. DHP get excited. DHP has a connection with another channel to, to open the door of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what you see here is the calcium. This is the calcium we have been looking for. We need calcium to excite, to activate, the, to remove the tropomyosin. So that's the action we, what we need to cause the muscle contraction. And that's how we do it. That's how our body do it. Action potential travel down to the T tubule, activate the HP receptor, and uh, it will open up this sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, this channel is called RYR. We will see it in the next slide. Then this RYR channel open, calcium will flow out, and that calcium will bind on the troponin to remove the tropomyosin to allow the mouse in heads to bind to it. Sorry. So this is a T-tubule. T-tubule is the extension from the cell membrane, so action potential can travel down here to the, to the uh, inner portion of the muscle. You can see that, you can see that T-tubule can all down, down the way down here. So this is the extension of the extracellular is the extension from the of the extracellular space and uh, this membrane the TT membrane is the extension of the of the uh, cell membrane the plasma membrane here in the muscle we call it uh, sarcolima <clears throat> um, and uh, and uh, there they are designed the way that they basically adjust adjacent to the uh, uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum is the is equivalent to the endoplasmic reticulum in typical cell. Here we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Is there a term here? Here, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And uh, this place contains a lot of calcium. So action potential will travel down here, even down here, uh, to 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 activate uh, the uh, the 
the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum to allow the calcium to flow out. So when calcium flow out, it, it will bind on the troponin C, then it will cause the conformational change to remove the tropomyosin, then the myosin heads can bind on the actin. As we already know, myosin head has this actin binding site. Actin has this mousing binding site. So when they see each other, they are like meant to be. I have the mousing binding site, you have the actin binding site. I happen to be the mousing, you happen to be the actin. So boom, they bind together and, uh, and then they can conduct the contraction. Ready for that, but not yet. It's because that calcium itself is not enough. They bind, but they don't have the energy to move. The energy to move the mouse in hand is ATP. So that's the next thing we will talk about, the ATP. Before that, let's kind of wrap it up, this uh, calcium uh, uh, homeostasis in a cell. So I want to, you need to have a concept that all cells has very low calcium. Calcium is very, uh, is a very, a lot of function. So here, calcium is very active. Um, so in a cell, we have a lot of potassium, but we don't have the calcium. Calcium can, can induce so many things inside of cell. Here, we only see one that calcium binds on the troponin C, but in general, calcium is very active in many ways. Um, so the typically cell has very low calcium concentration. And so cell will, if it's not needed, they will, they will clear it away very quickly. And in the muscle, because we need calcium to cause the contraction. So we need to kind of like, we cannot let it freely diffuse in the cells all the time. We need to put it in the storage room, right? Only when we need it, we take it out and we put it back. We take it out to put it back. This storage room is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we pump it uh, back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the inside cell is very low. Only when the cell is excited, the excitation coming from the nerve, acetylcholine binds on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, open up the sodium channel cause the action potential. That action potential will travel through the t tubule and then opens the uh, uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, to cause the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium, to open what? To open the RYR channel. And then that, that influx of the calcium only takes about very short period of time one over 20 seconds. And that is called, it has a special term, it's called calcium, calcium path or calcium spark. So, so that's one way to detect cell function is to have a calcium image. If you do research in the lab, you probably will have the research that look into the calcium image under the microscope and that calcium image you see light it up and uh, that's a sign of the muscle muscle function muscle contraction so to store then we will quickly pump the calcium back to the sarcoplasmic to, to do to do that we need to have a pump this one is the pump is called uh, sarcoplasm so endoplasmic reticulum calcium pump. You don't need to remember the full name, but you need to remember CERCA, S-E-R-C-A. This is very typical, very common thing that the CERCA is a pump to control, to pump the calcium back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So CERCA. And, uh, and you also need to know that when we pump a lot of ion back to the these organelles, um, it will quickly reach a limitation. 
So we need to have another way to pack them together. Here we have a protein called calsequestrin, CSQ. So this calsequestrin are proteins that will, it's like a sponge. It will absorb, sponge can absorb water here. Calsequestrin will absorb calcium. So in the environment, the calcium is, is it can be can be can be not too much. So circa pump the calcium back in, there there are not too condensed to keep the calcium coming in because we have this protein, this sponge to absorb this this large amount of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So circa and uh, Kels question are important. That's also a quick question. Where do we see the Kels uh, question in the muscle cell? The location, which organelle? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, so that that's that's all we need. We have the calcium now. Mousing head binds with actin seems like a happy ending, but the story is, story is not end yet. The mouse and head need to move, right? So that movement require ATP. All right, so the ATP will, will, uh, will become ADP to release phosphate, and that release of the phosphate generate use that chemical energy to convert it to move this mouse in head. So this is the, the process is called power stroke cycle. So to move the mouse in head each time, to move it one time is called a power stroke. So here uh, you can see that uh, we have the uh, mousing head in the beginning, let's end here. So when we have the calcium, right? We have the calcium. That's a uh, mousing head, see the actin. So these two connect together. And so we have that. The next thing is that we need to have ATP. Uh, in fact, when ATP binds on it, these two are detached to each other. ATP will cause the mouse and head to detach to each other because it need to prepare it. And then ATP will split to ADP and the phosphate. When it split that, it generate, it provide the chemical energy to tilt the mouse in head. And then it will release one phosphate. When it release one phosphate, the mouse in head will then attach to the actin. And then when they release the ADP as well as phosphate, the mouse in head tilt. And that provide that when they release everything, then it has the energy to tilt the mouse in head. And that's power stroke. And then it will remain there unless you provide it ATP. So one concept is very important is that without ATP, mouse in head will attach to actin forever. Okay, they will stay there forever. And that is the reason that Sorry, so this one summarize uh, what we had just have said. Um, the, uh, the power stroke cycle, ATP split, ADP plus phosphate, the mouse in head will uh, like a tilt it to get ready, has that energy ready. Through so phosphate, it will bind on the Act, active binding on the active side, binding on the actin. 
So the ADP, when everything's stored, the mouse in head will move and uh, remain attached. New ATP binds to it will allow it to be detached. So without ATP, without the new ATP, the mouse in head will bind, will bind with the actin forever. And that is the phenomena to what? All right, I will continue. I don't have that slides here. So basically that's um, the, uh, uh, the body, if it's dead, it doesn't have the ATP. All right, let me, let me do this one here. So I want to repeat that one, this one here. So this power stroke cycle is that <clears throat> when ATP split to ADP and the phosphate, then the, uh, then the arm moved. And then when it released the phosphate, it will bind to the actin, binds to the active sites. And then when it re remove the ADP, everything are, is removed, then, then the mouse in head will tilt. And before it see the new ATP, it will remain attached. And that's the phenomenon that uh, for the uh, dead body, the muscle will appear rigid. That's because that there's no new ATP. And uh, the mouse in head bind with the acting uh, to cause this muscle become very rigid. The source of the ATP coming from our local ATP, and then we will first use the phosphocreatine uh, to generate, to replenish the ATP, and then we will start to use the glycogen to use the glucose. The way we burn the glucose through these two process, one is called the anaerobic exercise anaerobic metabolism that is called glycolysis. And then the glycolysis will produce the pyruvate. Pyruvate will then be used to, through these mitochondria, we talk about the mitochondria in the cells, to produce the, um, to produce more ATP. And that portion, we need oxygen to conduct the oxidative phosphorylation and this portion is an aerobic uh, exercise, aerobic metabolism. 
So the energy source will immediately we use the uh, ATP that we have in the cell, and then we use creatine phosphate, cre uh, creatine phosphate, and then we have the uh, anaerobic and the aerobic uh, uh, metabolism. So this is the phosphocreatine that basically contains the phos pho phosphate group to 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 cause this uh, ADP phosphorylation to produce the um, uh, ATP. So that's the first resource that we will use. The next one is the glycogen. So glycogen is the uh, polysaccharide. Uh, it has many. Uh, it's a it's a combination of lots of protein. Uh, sorry, a lot of uh, glucose. And then this glucose can be used to generate energy. So it will, uh, glucose will conduct this uh, glycolysis, glucose through this glycolysis to produce the pyruvate. During that process, you generate two ATP from one molecule. So it's not like zero, it still generate ATP. And then pyruvate, if there's no oxygen, you will only receive two ATP and you have the lactate as a result. If you do have the oxygen, you know, we provide the oxygen to the cell. The pyruvate then will enter into the mitochondria to conduct the uh, citric acid cycle to produce what? NADH, FADH2. <clears throat> and that will, use to, that will be used to produce the uh, to conduct the oxidative phosphorylation to produce ATP. Not just glucose, we can also use fat. Fat go into the fat can enter into the mitochondria through the beta oxida oxidation. Beta oxidation will then convert the fatty acid that's the monomer of the triglyceride. And then it will start to convert that into the acetylcholine. Acetylcholine then enter into the citric acid cycle, produce NADH and FADH2. And the NADH, FADH2 will go to the electron transport chain to donate its hydrogen, hydrogen gradient, will push through the inner membrane and to cause this oxidative phosphorylation to generate a lot of ATP. So you have the idea that the ATP is needed to allow muscle, uh, to about allow the muscle head to move. And that ATP immediate source is the phosphocreatine and then we have the glycolysis, and then we have the oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, we will first use glycogen because glycogen are immediately in the muscle. Muscle has contains this glycogen as storage of the glucose. So you will learn the muscle, you will learn the glycogen in the same time uh, you're adipocytes, your uh, fat, you know, you also store a lot of energy there, you know, for for a reason that when you need energy, those um, fat cells will release their triglyceride. Triglyceride will be split to produce this fatty acid. This fatty acid will come in. So you will have the glucose, then you will burn your glycogen first, then then you will burn your uh, fatty acid. And all this will produce the ATP needed for myosin head to move. So here is a concept about the excitation and the contraction. There is a delay because when we excite a muscle, uh, it generates the action potential. As you can see here, this is an action potential. That action potential will cause calcium open, calcium channel open to allow calcium to flow into the cell. 
and the to cause muscle contraction. But there is a delay. That delay uh, um, cause this uh, separation of the excitation and the contraction is not at the same time. This contraction is called a twitch. So this twitch. And the muscle can be classified into the fast twitch muscle and the slow twitch muscle. So, so we have the uh, twitch, uh, very, very brief contraction of the muscle from each excitation. Uh, that excitation has to be above the threshold and uh, there is latent latency, latent period between stimulation and uh, uh, contraction. Muscle has the fast twitch muscle and the slow twitch muscle. So it's just different type of the muscle. The length of the sarcomere, uh, if it's too long, there will be no overlap of the mousing and the acting Like this one here, no overlap, then it generates almost like zero tension, zero contraction. Uh, if it's too short, then there's no space for further contraction, so they will generate small contraction. So the opt optimal length of the sarcomere is in the middle that you have some overlap, but you are not too much overlap of the thick filaments and the thin filaments. So this one summarizes the muscle contraction that we need to know. We only talk about this essential portion that's a, a very basic uh, pathway to cause muscle contraction. So, so this figure basically summarizes it. We first need to have the nerve stimulation. Uh, the nerve will, will uh, Uh, the nerve coming from the other motor neuron in the spinal cord will will release all right right here will release the acetylcholine. Uh, the nerve going to the axon terminal release the acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. We didn't talk about this uh, recycling here. We will talk about that when we talk about neuromuscular junction. All right. So in the synapses, uh, axon terminal release acetylcholine. Acycholine will bind on the nicotinic acycholine receptor. It will trigger an, an amplate potential. If that amplate potential is high enough, it will trigger an action potential. Action potential travel along the membrane through T tubule, activate the DHP channel. Uh, it will open up the RYR channel in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, allow calcium to flow into the cytosol, bind on the troponin C. Troponin C will cause the conformational change to remove the tropomyosin. Then the actin and the myosin see each other, they will bind together. But it's not the end of story, they need ATP. ATP provides into the myosin head and it causes the muscle, muscle head to conduct its power stroke. And then we have the muscle contraction. That's it. Thank you. I hope this worked. <laughs>